Anne, welcome. We love your work and can I ask, start by asking you, in your practice you've done works on a wide range of themes, filming in Antarctica, taking pictures of your own daughter's mouth, but over the years you've returned again and again to bees, both as an artist and I get the impression also as an individual. Why bees? <laughs> Good question. Anyway, lovely, lovely to be here, lovely to talk with you and have an opportunity to talk about this work. Um, so why bees? Well, I became a beekeeper and I think as any beekeeper, anyone who becomes a beekeeper and becomes fascinated with bees will, I suppose, concur with that you suddenly, you become enraptured by them. You become fascinated by them and, and as an artist that, that always then says, well, how do I find a way to talk about some of the things that I'm seeing and learning? And this, so, and, and the desire to make art or to, or to uh, explore something through photography and through the, the various processes that I use is always a, <clears throat> it always runs alongside learning about something at depth. So that fascination and love of bees and of beekeeping then creates some wonderful challenges because actually, how do you? How do you photograph bees? How do you? What what can I do? What what kind of uh, so various? Yeah, I was fascinated with various aspects. You know, the the first time my hive swarmed, uh, I happened to be there and out poured uh, thousands of bees, and the air was thick with bees, and they settled in a pahutakawa tree thirty feet up. No way was I going to be able to retrieve them. But they were sitting in this large, beautiful, kind of heart-shaped form, just kind of present on their way to somewhere else. And uh, so I, I loved that experience of actually, you know, my hive swarming um, set me on a journey to, to think about swarming bees. How might I make photographs of swarms? Yeah. A lot of your work examines our relationship with nature as a species. And you've talked, I believe, about the perils of anthropomorphizing our fellow creatures. Can you tell us about how, in your practice and approach to your work, you think about bees and bee colonies to avoid that pitfall? Yes, I, I think, I suppose as an artist, these are, these are some of the questions that drive your interest. For instance, you know, we... we as a beekeeper, you suddenly you become aware of the extraordinary complexity of uh, systems, living systems, and the bee, a colony of bees, is a, a complex living system. But it's intricately connected to the world beyond in ways that are really, you know, as soon as you begin to watch and observe, it's beyond our comprehension. Uh, people have been observing bees for thousands of years, uh, and we know quite a lot about bees, but there is something about this kind of relationship amongst the colony itself and to the wider world belong, beyond that is, I'm in awe of it still. So what it, we tend to view other species and from the perspective of being the pinnacle species. So that we are, you know, we have consciousness. Uh, and I go, hmm. So the kind of questions that art engages with as well. I'm not so sure about that. You know, if we, if this becomes a, a privileged state of humankind, what about bee consciousness? What about, what about this marvellous possibility of a hive having consciousness? And as, a, as an entity of 70,000 uh, beings, uh, and those then become the kind of questions that art can wonder about, muse about, that science wouldn't even dare ask you. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> At the core of a lot of your work is prolonged observation and attentive watching. Indeed, the title of your book, Conversatio, links into this concept. Can you expand, expand more on that concept and the kind of approaches it leads you to take? Yes, it's a, it's a, a beautiful word. It's, a, it's a, a Latin word, conversatio. It's the root 
word of what we know as conversation, which we often associate with speaking, <laughs> talking, where actually it, it's, its origins are in Benedict monasticism. And I actually happen to have had a residency privilege to, to undertake a residency at a, re, at a monastery in central France that had been re-decommissioned and established as a contemporary art and music centre. I had three months there and during the time, you, the invitation was to create a work that might uh, speak to contemporary audiences, certainly about bees and the natural world, but also reflect on the kind of the traditions, the long traditions of um, the place itself. Bees are part of monastic culture, so uh, bees lived in the buildings, you know, I could hear bees, there were swarms happening. Um, so part of my thoughtfulness around a project for this place really related then thinking about the traditions of, you know, of monasticism. And this notion of conversatio was, it, it has many, many meanings, but I, uh, I particularly, I picked up this, it's a quality of silent and attentive listening. And that is a kind of quality that I love to bring to my work, but also hope to inspire in audiences. And there's a little kind of wry, to me, a little sense of, it's a bit of a paradox, you know, if it means attentive listening, uh, it's really then the most important component of any conversation. So preceding speech is the state of attentive being. Now that is something to bring to Look at, looking at bees. The work shows that approach really strongly and I love the photographs of the decommissioned monastery where you project some of these images up in the cloisters and, mm. and I believe it would guess. I know you like to listen to the sounds of bees in your beehive. Um, I was wondering, what can you actually tell about what's going on in the beehive by listening to the sounds of the colony? Oh, they're, they, they, um one thing I like to do is to, you know, watching the bees come home late in the afternoon, uh, there's a, a saying, or it's, it's in sort of mythic bee culture, that the bee, bees are carriers of the souls of the dead. And sitting watching bees flying home, when the light's low, they suddenly, there's this moment when the light's low enough that they're catching the, the wings. So the bees are like these flashes of light coming and going. And there is this, I could, I could understand why that kind of sight might have prompted this idea or the sense of them being carriers of human souls or that flash of light. But so listening, I watch them at night, but I also dropped microphones inside the hive and very, very good quality microphones. So I'd, I'd drop them in and I'd sit and listen to them. And yeah, you hear all sorts of it's just a general kind of hum. There's a the sound of a happy, contented hive. Uh, there's the sound of the entranceway. There's the sound of drones. There's, you know, you can start to distinguish. After a little while, they don't like microphones. They, I think they, they will react. So you can also detect a change in the uh, sound around the microphone. It's a general virtual one. Um, can you just briefly tell us about the various different ways bees communicate to each other? Well, I, I'm speculating. <laughs> I, um, I do know that smell is very important, that bees will know the smell of their beekeeper. There's long been a kind of, these are things that you learn as a beekeeper, never go heavily perfumed near your beehive, because the bees will not like it. Well, I suppose if you were smelling of their favourite flowers. But anyway, they're very acutely sensitive to smell. Um, so, so, yes, yeah, so their sensitivities relate to things that science is investigating in extraordinary ways. So how they see, how they perceive, and how they communicate. Um, well, I, I'm not a bee, but, but I know that their perceptual mechanisms are far more complex than we would uh, we Im imagine. Uh, and I love this idea that, uh, you know, we pride ourselves on the number of neurons in our brain as if that's giving us some kind of uh, 
edge on other beings who might have some, only some million neurons instead of what we have. And yet, what is extraordinary is that those, that, that, that brain is such a, an acutely precision in organism. So, you know, the, I, I laugh, I go, the number of neurons has got nothing to do with uh, um, superiority of functioning. In fact, we're probably inhibited by the massive grey rubbish in our heads. <laughs> I didn't answer your question, really. Around how do they I was thinking as well common? more about the thing about how um, the bee dance could communicate with certain flowers and yes. pollination yeah. and things so, like that. So it's kind of vibration, uh, smell, touch, movement. Uh, and they've got, so you, you can talk about language. How do they, how do they their, la- their language is oh, multi various. I do know that flowers. Uh, communicate to bees because at certain times of the day when they are kind of give up, giving off their nectar and they want the bees to, that they will radiate ultraviolet light. So there is a whole world, a perceptual world, happening between flowers and plants and bees that we do not see. So there's a perceptual world beyond our understanding. But the bee dance is a phenomenal thing because it involves uh, a, um, uh, mathematics. Uh, and very understanding and communicating the relationship of uh, a flower or a nectar source to the sun. So um, people, scientists have done this, do it in terms of geometry. And the bee dance is actually communicating a kind of distance, um, the angle of uh, position of something in relationship to the sun, uh, and bees will be able to follow exactly a set of instruction communicated by this dance. It's either a circle or uh, an eight, so they communicate distance by the oh, by a whole range of mechanisms. Photography is, in a sense, all about time. And the photographic image captures the ghost of a moment, a fragment of memory. And in your work, you've actually imagined photographs taken from a point in future time. Um, can you talk to us about the representation of time in your work? I often think that there are two primary kind of tools that a photographer has. Time is one of them, because actually a photograph can kind of disturb our sense of time, but it can also slow time and actually create, which I really love to see or find in a photograph, a state of reverie, where you stop and actually can rethink or reimagine your relationship to something a little differently. So time is uh, a part, it's one of the primary tools. So you stop time, but you also expand an experience of a moment. So the sense of time or photography creating that opportunity for an expanded moment. I think that's a kind of um, Henry James idea or William James idea, that uh, that sense of the expanded moment. Um, but also light then, light and time combined become the kind of tools that you, you use. And they're both, they're both, one's a kind of an interior mode of experiencing the world and, and light is your means of kind of translation of something you observe. Mm. Plus, there's no other medium that's actually dealing with the surface appearance of the world as photography does. So it enables you to enhance our experience of the physical world and the material world. Some of the images you've got are electron microscope photographs of dead bees. And they're amazing photographs and quite profound. But again, they aren't conventional photographic images in any way. (laughs) Um, Because, for example, they don't use light. And you've discussed a little bit about how they came about. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about the process of taking an electron microscope photograph of? Well, I, I made these in the laboratory of Jean-Pierre Martin, Martin the scientist who I, um, who I mentioned. And uh, he showed me this as a process, uh, and which is something that he, he wanted to show me he, how he saw bees as a scientist. And we were talking about how the, the subtleties of kind of bee biology that you can see in a scanning electron microscope. So when I put a bee into the microscope, I saw something incredibly different. 
So I started uh, using it, not as a, a means to understand the invisible kind of um, hairs on the eye of a bee, but more as a way to make a portrait. So this idea of using a scientific instrument to make a portrait of a bee. And again, recognising really by chance the kind of qualities this image making process had. And I'd been working with bee wings and delighted and engaged with their translucency and the way that light passes through a, a wing and has all sorts of qualities that are quite amazing. But these images don't really use light. So the process is a, a, a bee is coated, it's a lovely word, it's sputter coated with gold. So a molecule thin layer of gold is a coat, you coat a dead bee with this tiny bit of gold. It then goes into a vacuum, into the chamber of the microscope, and the gold activates an electron beam which kind of then is like a data, it's reading it. It's a little bit, it's very similar in a sense, conceptually, to how light kind of passes across something to make it visible. But when I looked at the photographs, they had this strange quality that I couldn't identify and that the wings of bees should be translucent. So if you have a sense of light, and yet these were kind of like thick, they looked like they were covered by uh, dust, like a thick coating of dust. And it gave me then the sense of them having been found somewhere a long time in the future where when bees no longer exist, so that they were these kind of monumental objects that had this quality of sculptures or quality of kind of portraits that were from another time. Mm. So I, I, again, I liked that. So I then made this work really utilising these particular qualities to speak about the, the yeah, kind of a for the bees in a future time when the museum, when the bee no longer exists. So I created an installation that was really like a, a museum in which these were kind of hauntings from a future. The, uh, the are incredible images, the monumental ghost electron microscope images. I had a kind of question, is there an intentional connection to religious altarpieces that you talked about LG quality of your artwork and to me they reminded me of some sort of kind of futuristic icon image of nature. Yes, well I I made these photographs and something about photography photography because it's often has us um, think about something from the past or something that we've lost has an automatic, it can be elegaic very easily. And yet, my own pleasure with bees is not around their death, it's around their life. So I was challenged really to think about how I might make an artwork that really spoke both about the, the death or the loss of something, but also about life. So the work that's at the centre of the book, Conversation, which is also the title of this work, was really an idea to take both ideas and put them together. So instead of a photograph being a, a, an elegaic uh, and sad uh, monument to a, a dying or a, a species that we may risk losing, um, I wanted to put a living colony of bees at its, at its heart. So the idea for that work really draws from two sources. One, this kind of 18th century idea of a cabinet of curiosity or a cabinet of wonder. But it's also structured to uh, reference a medieval icon, so this, an altarpiece. So it has a kind of the, uh, the eyes of bees on the outside and when it's opened, what you have is a kind of an, an icon, a living system at its heart. So it's, there's definitely a, um, yeah. Of course there's lots of Christian yeah. Myths about beads and bee habits. Yes. <laughs> um, we see the photographs, Edelon, is close up images of bee wings. They are semi abstract, and like the title suggests, they're ideal images of phantoms or spectres, kind of fleeting, ghostly but beautiful. Can I ask you about the aesthetics of beauty in your pieces? 
do you come with an intention of, I would like this image to achieve this effect, or is it more it evolves through the process? Both, I think. I think there is a... Um, you always, you are looking, um, and I don't know what that... I don't know exactly what that is that I'm looking for, but I often will find it and know. <laughs> and I think it is, a, for me, a photograph succeeds when it shows me something in a way that I have not seen it before. Uh, but it also operates uh, in a kind of an interior sense. So it's, it's about, and it's one of the lovely ironies of photography that I love, is that it's dealing with the, kind of the appearances of the world, and yet it's pointing to an experience of those things that we cannot see. So that is what I look for in, I guess, if it's beauty or if it's in uh, the aesthetic qualities, qualities of an image. I want, I want it to be something that is come back to again and again. So it's to dwell on something over time as an image, or maybe <laughs> feed your soul. <laughs> So, Professor Annabelle, thank you so much for the time you've spent with us and the fabulous interview. We're really grateful. <laughs> My pleasure.